Why are you here? Yeah, I know. The schedule got all jacked up. So this one, the practice today, this morning, wasn't open to media. It was just scouts only. Well, you were supposed to be at the Nike Hoop Summit practices Yikes. today. So, oops. That's a thing. And your schedule uh, conflicts happen. And now you're here. We're happy to have you here. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're in today. Tomorrow, I'm for sure he's not here. Okay. Okay. You got you got to go and thirst over some high school boys, huh? Yes. That's that's yes, the that's, plan. that's, that's the happening. plan tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Some teenage boys you got to leer at. <laughs> yeah, I got I got I got to do a double dose. It's uh, in the mornings at Nike and then in the afternoons hey. at the the PF. Hey, he's I'll... a big ass boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Go look at some high school butts. Wow, um, that's a whole thing, man. We can kiss my ass. It happens. Um, but it is Nike Hoop Summit week, uh, in that this is a big deal because there's a lot of uh really. Big, really, really big, 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 big prospects coming in. Yeah, no, like I said, there's uh like 13 of the top 20. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. That's yeah, a lot. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a, it's a lot, a lot. So like, no, when 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 it came last year, I hopped out for like half a day. It was like because we knew. Yeah, well, look, this it's, year's draft class no. <laughs> not not the uh, a, one to write home about. Yeah, we had a reeling suspicion. I'm like, ah, I'll pop in, get to the ones that I can, but I'm not gonna miss the show for it. This year's I'm gonna miss the show for because it's yeah. Cooper Flag in town. Yep, Cooper Flag's in town. VJ Edge Edgecomb in town. Ace right. Bailey in town. Whoa. Yeah, it's um. Look at that. It's a lot. Well, um, that'll be a fun time. And it though those those are a good time because I think people don't really realize this is like the epicenter of the NBA world. Yeah, everyone. this week it's the final week of the regular season. Mm -hmm. And there will not be a general manager or a president of basketball operations that here. is not in the city of Portland for that event this week. Which, which pretty, pretty kick ass. Yeah. No. No. The uh, the world team got in I think last night, and they had a they had a private schedule or a private practice. Oh. Um, but after that, yeah, it's 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 going to be pretty nuts. Just like looking at the list right now. Uh, Ace Bailey, Cooper Flag, Boogie Fland, Dylan Harper. Trey Johnson, Asa Newell. We need more people named Boogie. Yeah. It, Boogie is a great well, his first name, name is uh Boogie. John, John Ewell. John what? Like John, J-O-H-N, and then U E L. Like Samuel and John, John got just like Jimothy together. Yeah. Like Jimothy Butler. Yeah. Jimothy Garoppolo. Mm -hmm. But Boogie Fland is along with um, cool name. God, there's one other guy in uh oh Jaden Quinton's. Acquaintance, uh, or both Kentucky commits that. Uh, Wait, his last name is Acquaintance? Acquaintance. Oh, Acquaintance. Yes, Q-U-A-I-N-T-A-N-C-E. -A -A -E. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were saying Acquaintance. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, and that's on the, the, the Team USA side. So that's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven top 20 guys on the, on the U.S. side. And then on the world side, it's... Oh the God! World. One, two, three, four, five of the top ten. Ooh, Count Meringue over here. Yeah. Ah, 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 uh, ah, 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 but yeah, ah. you've got uh, the, oh, that's good. The two the two top guys going to Duke in Cooper Flag mm. and Common uh, Malik, who he Common is the seven foot two kid. If you haven't that's heard about uncommon. him, they got some great names. Yeah, at it's, the it's, Nike it's, it's spelled K H A M A N. Hmm. Not like the rapper. No, not like the rapper. Okay. Or actor. No. He does yeah, both. Great in John Wick. Philanthropist. Mm -hmm. Hey, the subway scene in John Wick too. Love it. I don't there's just so many killing in that movie. So much killing in that movie. I don't The I suppressor don't know. under the arm in the in the crowd of people. Oh. Yeah, oh, so none of them here yeah. somehow. Yeah. And then they stab each other on the Well, you don't know train. what subways are like. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of noise going on. I've been on, on a subway. You know, you don't Look, know. Man, here. I will split You're the, above all that. I will split the difference. For Number normal one, people, they can't hear it. People are dumb, and they don't see things regularly. Number two, the one thing that movies kind of get right is the sound of suppressors. They are very quiet. If you're using cold-loaded ammo with a, like a full-length suppressor, it sounds like a, like a, like a BB gun. What if you're most. using warm ammo? That's a great question. What what's the difference? Like what if it's heated Sub, up? No, subsonic cold ammo. It's, Hand it's, up, a, non gun guy. Yeah, subsonic. don't know what that means. Not gun guy. Yeah, it means same. Okay, subsonic means uh, lower grain, so it it doesn't. The FPS is lower, feet per second, muzzle velocity. Okay, but the killie is the same. Yeah, within ranges. Yeah, your drop offs. Uh, 
much more consistent. Like on a subway, you're good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, they're shooting in the station. One's up top, one's down below. I did just watch this movie. It's not like a spit wad. Like it's 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 coming out with still. Boop. Yeah. If I'm right, I think pew he was. Pew. I think he was using a 45. So it's got enough. That's a. It's a big heavy round. I think that would be a cool job to be a sound effects person. Have you seen those videos of like what they're actually doing? Like when they when it's like walking on crunchy leaves. They're oh yeah, sitting there and I, like they come, the some of the stuff instead they of come actually up using with, the actual sound. Yeah, they got like a bag of Doritos and they're yeah. just like throwing it on the ground. And you're like, oh, okay. I that don't uh, like. That's why when when movies do, it's particularly like any any. Any film that uses like actual sound and and stays true to like what the mechanics are like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy in the movie, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, that's right. That the guy, guy. That guy. The guy in the movie. Keanu Reeves went through like six months of three gun training. So sure, three, yeah. three, three guns is a guns. shooting competition. It's pistol, shotgun, rifle, and he went through like pretty intense CQB training. And if you watch the movie, there isn't a single time where. It's it's true to the to the mechanics of the firearm. So if it's an if, if it's an eight and one, so if there's eight rounds in the mag plus one in the chamber, he has nine rounds, and then he goes to pull, and then there's nothing there, so he has to change guns. So it's like it's they actually stay true to that. And mm. as a gun nerd, I love that. Isn't All that just the because whole somebody thing? killed his dog? Yeah, you you know it's loosely based off of a real story, right? It's loosely based off Keanu Reeves' life? No. Not his uh, life. No, uh, Marcus Luttrell, the SEAL, somebody killed his dog and he went on a rampage after these guys and he let him live, but yeah. So there's another movie about Marcus Luttrell? It's not a movie. It well, I mean, very Well, he has, yeah. there's another movie. Yeah, the Lone Survivor. That's but right. yeah, John Wick is very, good. very, very, the very beginning of it is loosely based on yeah that happening. I would say that is very loosely yeah. based. Yeah. I would say that after that moment. Uh-huh. Yep. Every well and wait, so people broke into his house and killed his dog? Stole his dog. Uh I gotta I gotta I believe they stole time. his dog if I remember right. They they like, took it and then he Wait, chased Marcus him down. Luttrell or Marcus Luttrell. No, in napping. John Wick they kill his dog. I was gonna say I don't I Reek, know. Marcus Luttrell's dog his whose dogs were killed by four thugs. Oh, I thought uh, and he went after them. Okay. Yeah. It's not a guy I would oh. mess with in any way. <laughs> no, God, no, Mm-mm. no, Mm-mm. no. no this, those are bad life. Choices. No, the six foot four Navy SEAL is not the guy I would choose. But also, um, injuring dogs, also uh, just a bad choice in general. Oh God, like, you have the, the kind of mon- to kill a dog, like in malice. Yeah, you, I think you kind of deserve what comes your way. You know what is jarring. Hmm. How many countries around the world eat dogs, cats, and horses? I saw this thing of like, there's 75 billion chickens. Oh yeah, that are like, killed every year. The the and food chain like, stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it was I was it was jarring yeah. how many dogs, dogs, cats, and horses. Yeah, they were up high on the list. There's like five million dogs that are eaten every year. It's yeah. like, uh, uh, here they taste like chicken. Duh, that's not true. You don't know that. No. I said I heard. N- you say you said here here, here not, they not taste I like hear. chicken, as in like stateside. Heard. heard. I, you hear? I, I heard. I hear. Hey, Will Ortner's here. Hi, heard. Will Ortner. Hi. How you doing? Uh, I'm watching soccer, so not great. <laughs> oh, you, go Arsenal. Are you anti soccer guy? Yeah, but my buddy bet on it, so I wanted to bet with him. So. No, no, I'm so watching you Arsenal bet on soccer. a sport you don't like. I ride with my boys. There's nothing better than gambling with your boys. And that's what I'm doing. You're not completely wrong about that. That is always a, a fun rush to have. Enjoy with the buddies. Joy, joy with the boys. All right, uh, 503-864-6326. That'd be the Vancouver Ford text line. Your dollar goes further at Vancouver Ford. They treat you right before, during, and after the sale. Visit them online at VancouverFord.com. Um, this segment has been Danny Talking Guns. Um, mm. John Wick and dogs, um, all 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 my lanes covered. Well, I throw some basketball in there too, and some death. Yeah, yeah, and we got basketball yeah, in there as well. In. I mean, I don't know how we pivoted so quickly from Nike Hoop Summit to John Wick, but well, we got there. We stuck the landing. Both have shooters. That's true. That's the Venn diagram right there. That's true. Saw on Whiteside. We we got shooters. That's uh, Son Whiteside, uh, Marcus Luttrell. Boy, that might John be Wick. like the Danny's l- motto. We got shooters. Mm. I keep that thing on me it's too. It's your lane. 
It's your lane. Pause. <laughs> you're you're in it. You're, you're in it. All right. Uh, well, speaking of team that doesn't have shooters, uh, how about Purdue last night? Hey. Holy guacamole. Yeah. We got Kings of the Court dominance uh, by the UConn Huskies. We'll get to that on today's radio program. Uh, which team has got to knock it out of the park in the NFL draft? Um, it's mainly in that first round, too. We will have uh, that on the docket today as well. Bob Herrig will join us. He is a Sports Illustrated golf writer. He has a new book out. It's called Drive. It's about Tiger Woods and his drive to compete. Did you see Tiger Woods uh, comment yesterday at the Masters? He was asked, why do you keep coming back to this? And he said, "Uh, I just love golf. His body's breaking down. He's getting older. But dude just wants to compete on the golf sure. course. Drive, the new book by Bob Herrick. He'll join us at 115. We'll hey. talk a little Masters, talk a little Tigre and uh, the world of golf. But where we got to start, uh, the Yukon Huskies crowned again. Danny and Dusty on the fan. emphatically eliminating Purdue 75-60, running away with that thing in the second qu- second half. Second Stupid quarter. Stupid half. Yeah. In the second half and uh, putting an exclamation point on another season of dominance. The first team to go back-to-back 
as national champions since the 2006 and 2007 Florida Gators. And uh, that game was, you even felt at the beginning, Zach Eady played really stinking well. Mm -hmm. But you got that feeling at the beginning that the better team from the jump was the Connecticut Huskies. Yeah, no, you you did, and and that was because of it was highlighted really by the in, early leading the broadcast. I thought I think it was Kenny, it might have been Kenny that said it, might have been, might have been Chuck. Can't remember who it was, but the the point they made going into the game was it's not a matchup of Edie and Klingon because if Klingon doesn't score, UConn can still win. Absolutely. If Edie doesn't score, Purdue has no chance. Toasty. Because the difference in this teams and how they went after, I thought it was really interesting. Number one, we got to see what what we expected, which was. Klingon played Edie straight up because he's seven foot two, and Edie hit some incredible shots. Not only in the first half, but all game long. I'll say Edie showed burst that we had not seen throughout the course of the tournament too. He, like there he was had to work. There was some like okay, there's a little bit of that NBA player that you may be mm-hmm. seeing in Zach Edie, where it was he looked like he was playing faster. He looked like he was more explosive, and dude worked his ass off last night. They didn't lose because of Zach Eady. No, no, he he went to work. But the thing was, is that you've got a UConn team that defensively, beyond Klingon working as the as a rim protector uh, and that anchor for them defensively, you've got Stephon Castle, you've got Caravan, you've got Spencer, you've got Newton, who are all capable guys. You you've got two graduate transfers. I, and, there is something in that team that UConn, if Spencer is on Duke. And the world hates Cam Spencer. Oh God, yes, because he he is a Duke point guard mm-hmm. through and through. He is gritty. He is not the best player on the floor. Get him in, but you stuff. just sit there and you go, "Oh my God, he's how is he doing this?" Yeah, just, whether it was yeah. rebounding, whether it was you know the ancillary scoring that dude he let had. him in rebounding. He was absolutely all over the place for UConn, and then Danny Hurley. He is. I was sitting there watching the game, and I go, "He's actually Coach K, but actually lets his emotions out." Sure. You know how you would just get that 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 picture of Coach K just angry seeing, yeah. And you're like, "What's going on in that guy's brain?" There's no doubts about what's in Danny Hurley's nope. brain because he lets it all out there. Intrusive whether thoughts it's, win very regularly. Whether it's chirping at Zach Eady, whether it's turning around chirping at the crowd and letting them know at the end of the game. You know, it was like he will let everybody in the arena know mm-hmm. exactly how he feels. And I think that from a fan perspective, we all appreciate that a, a lot more. Like when he said that uh, the UConn fan base on the Internet is insufferable a-holes or S-heads, I think is yes. what he called them. Yeah, you mm-hmm. at least he's honest with everybody instead of like Coach K, who is just like insulated. I'm going to protect Duke. I'm going to protect my fans yeah. at all costs. And then I'm going to go and be preachy to other players. No, like Coach K, when he pulled Dylan Brooks aside, like looking at what we know now, <laughs> hindsight's right. 2020. Coach K, like pulling him aside and being like, you're better than that, or whatever. He tried to do it like subtly. Dan Hurley will just tell you. Just do it. During yeah. a game. He went onto the floor and pushed Cam Spencer mm-hmm. because he wasn't where he wanted to be in the national championship game, which is a wild move that you see. But they are a lot. Uh, there is a lot of Duke in the style that they play, the players that mm-hmm. they have. But it's the coach and the packaging of it that is completely different. I think that it makes people. It's more palatable for people. The really interesting thing about this is there's this thing in the NBA that I, I've heard for the last couple of years, and from scouts and from development coaches of you just can't you can't coach people. You can't coach these kids like you used to. Dan Hurley does. Yeah, he sure does. I, and I think that's part of where you have to give UConn and Hurley their credit beyond the you know being great is that they recruit guys and they bring guys in that want to be coached that way. They yeah, look, it's going to sound terrible. It's an old forty year old guy shaking fist at young kids, but there's way too many of these kids that are just absolute babies, coddled the whole way, just. They 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 want the path paved with gold. Just send me to the NBA and let me go get my millions. They don't want to develop. I've talked about this in the NBA. Everybody thinks that if you're in the NBA, like you're working the hardest, you're putting in all the time, and hmm. basketball is the number one thing to you. It's not. 
It's not. But it rarely is. But what ends up happening is, is, is some of, at some of these places is it becomes the number one thing. And there's organizations even in the NBA where championship and competitiveness is not the number one thing. It's just about turning revenue over. And you have that in college basketball where it's not about, I don't think at Kentucky the number one thing was about winning titles. It was about getting to the NBA. I think at UConn it is about developing and winning titles. Well, in like we've we all forgot because of what they became, but this started circulating last night and Dan Hurley called his shot in his second season mm-hmm. at UConn when this is right after they were eliminated from postseason contention for a third year in a row. You know, we got exciting young players. We got an older group of guys that are gonna that, that are gonna get enough wins this year that they'll feel good about the way their career ended. Uh, we got some exciting young players that are going to help lead us back. We're going to continue to recruit and develop and bring in the type of players that will bring UConn back. Um, you know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now because it, it's coming. That, that year, <laughs> that year, they went 19 and 12. They finished fifth in the AAC. And then. After that, when he's talking about we got young players, mm-hmm. James Booknight mm-hmm. was was a freshman on that team. The very next year, they brought in in the next recruiting class that came in the next year was Andre Jackson and Sonogo, mm-hmm. the, the forward from last backs. year, th- who all of those guys played pivotal roles mm-hmm. to UConn winning a national titles a year ago. And that's what you're talking about there. The development, it's yeah. a championship at all costs. And what he had said, like everybody kind of scoffed at it, like, dude, you're coming from Rhode Island where you won. You went to the tournament two years in a row, you won down. a tournament game. Let's take it easy there. No. Back-to-back national titles, and it's that conviction mm-hmm. towards winning and keeping, like we hear this all the time with Mike Tomlin, keep the main thing the main thing. Yep. That's exactly what you're talking about, which is a championship. The main thing at Kentucky, to your point, is getting you to the NBA. Yep. That's the main thing. At UConn, they are pissed off for greatness with Dan Hurley. And you'll get and to the I'm NBA. I'm here for it, man. You'll get to the NBA. It's a different style, though. It is it's, a it, it, different it is, world. Yes, it is a different preparation. It's a different level about how you go about it. Like You take a look at it right now. Stephon, Stephon Castle and Donovan Klingon are both lottery prospects. If you go to Kentucky over the last 10 years, how many of those have they had? How many have they had? 50? Yeah, prob- pr- probably, 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 yeah. Like it's, it's an obscene amount. But how effective have they been year in, year out in college basketball? How how good have they been about developing players? Well, and I think what Hurley does better than anybody right now is the we were talking about this before the show. It's the refusal of what Coach Cal did at Kentucky, yeah. which is Dan Hurley recruits developmental prospects and then says all right on a year-to-year basis where do i need to plug the holes yep. because last year they had three guys go to the nba mm-hmm. last year from their starting lineup this year they bring in guys like two graduate cam transfers. spencer from east Car- east carolina yeah. is that where ECU, he came from yeah. you you bring in and you plug those holes and say all right, what we're going to do is we know we have our developmental process. We are going to take guys that we see fit our system, fit our style, and that's where we become a championship caliber team. What Cal was doing at Kentucky and what we're thin is for the first month and a half of the season, he's throwing these guys to the wolves and saying, yep, hopefully they'll grow up. And they're all supremely talented, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't plug those holes and fill those gaps with the guys like a Cam Spencer, which – is n- nothing about that young man is going to blow your hair back except for he accentuates every single thing that another player does o- on the floor. And that's what makes this so impressive to me in what UConn has done winning back-to-back mm-hmm. titles. And the- because they, they are taking a, a broken system in college basketball right now with NIL and transfer portal and nobody knows the rules. Nobody knows how to assimilate to the, the goings on of the NCAA. Well, guess what? UConn figured it out. I mean, the perfect counterexample is Kentucky this year. You've got DJ Wagner Jr. 
you've got Justin Edwards who have these higher star profiles, yet Reed Shepard and, and Rob Dillingham are better players. And Wagner and Edwards, Wagner and Edwards starting and starting and starting and starting and starting because they're the higher profile NBA guys. Yeah. And everyone and their mom sitting there going, those two guys are better. Why aren't they starting? <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? And it was all because the, your system is designed to be a puppy mill for the NBA. Okay. Let's take what UConn is doing right now because Hurley said something in his post game that it, it caught my attention. It caught my eye. Because he threw down, and he was on an S talking spree, Holy. which was fantastic. But he said this is more impressive than anybody else who's done it back to back. Is it the most impressive back to back that we've seen? Because it's rarefied air. That after Will was Sports Center.
uh, decided in honor of WrestleMania, I'm going to cut some promos here. And rightfully so. When your team holds a a team in the national championship game to 14% shooting from three where you wouldn't have ever have guessed it last year, or last night, rather, but Purdue shot 40% from three this season. They were the third best three-point shooting team in the country. And they went one from seven, one for seven from beyond the arc, and it was sheer dominance by the Connecticut Huskies. And it was sad at the end of that game to watch Purdue down seventeen with like three minutes to play. They rolled over, just sitting there and continuing to. Hey, we're just going to dump the ball in the post to Edie, <laughs> and like because that's all they could do yeah. because UConn was like, take it, we'll give it to you. Yeah, they they just they Go took ahead. away all their shooters. They, they, sh- Go ahead. they had no shooting in the game. I what, mean, what we're going to do one is, of seven from three. We are going to let Zach Eady get his 37 points, and we are going to foul the living hell out of him. And Zach Eady, d- he is the guy, he does not get called for so many fouls. <laughs> Dude just swings his elbows <laughs> around recklessly. Well, he, he gets he gets the benefit on both or he takes he takes the brunt he of it takes on both sides. Because But my gosh, there yeah. were some there were some fouls where you were looking at it in Johnson, Samson Johnson, who fouled out, he was just looking around like are you going to call me for that, but not for the elbow that I just took to my temple? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's mostly it's when you're that big, number one, you get mauled on the offensive end. And so well, on the I understand it. Well, you but... Know, but I mean, on the defensive end, you're allowed to get away with some stuff just because well, you're a massive human. On the offensive end is where he fouls mostly. Oh. I, I think he, like he, every time he tries to pivot, his elbow is just, he's leading with his elbow it's, around. It's, well, I mean, everybody does that. It's just that the fact that he's seven foot four <laughs> makes it, Eyebrow height, <laughs> which is not which is problematic. Illegal. And when you lead with the elbow and you're not coming around with the ball, that's also where the foul. He's is. He's got a little nasty with him. He does. Yeah, but, I'm here for it. Yeah. I'm here for it. He had a hell of a game. We got to no, talk about him. Yeah. We got to talk about him a little bit later. But Dan Dan Hurley, we got to talk about the winners. My first. man went full red ass. He was cutting. He was cutting wrestling promos yeah. because he started on the podium with this. Yo, know, UConn's been running. For the last 25, 30 years, UConn's been running college basketball. And I see all the former champs over there. And we run, we've been running college basketball the last 30 years. Let's go. Um, I would say six national titles in 25 years is running college basketball. Six they, and oh in title games. They have more national titles than Duke and North Carolina combined since they won their first. Mm-hmm. We and we think of them as like they're a great program. We don't hold them in the regard that we do Duke and North Carolina. They're, it's about damn time we do. I think that's your age. Good, because my age of people like I think well, of UConn covered, as a blue blood. They're not covered the same. They are not covered no. the, nearly the same. Despite the fact that in the last two NCAA tournaments, not only have they been dominating teams, mm-hmm. they've covered the spread in every single yeah. game. They're not just beating the teams; they're beating Vegas. Yeah, they're beating the brakes off. Like, right. They can't set it high enough. <laughs> that they're, is crazy. They're dominating. But like for my age of people, it's the same thing with Tennessee football. Like remember last year when Tennessee football was good, and I mean, not to call you guys old, but your age of people was <laughs> saying like. Oh, it's great to have Tennessee back on top. And people who are my age are like, what are you talking about? Tennessee has never been on top. Or when they were, it's not something that I had witnessed before, right? UConn, their first title win is in, what, 99? So at some point, I have seen, and my generation has seen all of their titles. To us, UConn is a blue blood. To us, UConn is on par with Duke and North Carolina. They might not get the same coverage, but to us, like when I think of UConn, I think of championships in college basketball that's fair but they aren't covered the same because this year duke and north carolina like north carolina was talked about as this number one number one remember when we talked about the seeding i was like i don't like north carolina as a number one seed i just they don't they don't feel that great to me but they were talked about and covered this year in a manner that north carolina always gets hell ucla was still getting coverage halfway through the season and you're looking around like they suck and so you, you get the, the I mean, Kansas, you know, the, the Hunter Dickinson transfers to Kansas. So they're getting, it's like, when was the last time you saw a UConn game, which is hilarious because where's ESPN located? Bristol, Connecticut. When was the last time UConn was the featured matchup? Well, in, Big in East the, is Fox. 
But even then, nah, like, oh, we're going, we're going network wars. Well, I mean, like, I'm not trying. Yeah. I'm just saying they are Fox. You yeah. can still get the national games on, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like, you're right. The and the Big East has those matchups that get national recognition, and UConn is never in that zeitgeist. Villanova, even though they're Big East, guess where they're at? They're in that zeitgeist every single time we talk about they. Jay Wright kicked down the blue blood door and said, "Villanova's a blue blood. Deal with it." For whatever reason, even though UConn has been more successful than Villanova, UConn still hasn't been able to break through whatever weird paradox that exists that you, that like, does somebody have to leave the Blue Blood program? Like, does somebody no. need to tell UCLA to get out for UConn to get in? Yeah, they don't. Do, I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, UCLA in Arizona. Don't be, they don't belong. They don't belong that. right now. They don't belong. They in haven't been effective in thirty anymore. years. If you think about the most dominant programs over like the last twenty five years, I mean, it probably is. Well, it's UConn. Then you can go down to Kansas, Villanova, Kansas, Duke, North Carolina, and then Villanova. Yeah, I mean, Villanova's got two national titles. Mm-hmm. They've got two national titles, but they had Final Four runs in 2009, 2016, 2018, 2022. That's a lot of Final Fours. Pretty damn good. Yeah. And they won in 16 and 18. And that, to me, you're sitting there and you're going, yeah, they don't. in the last 25 years, they don't have the titles that match up because North Carolina and Duke have each won three mm-hmm. in that span. And they've gone to their Final Fours, too. But that those are the Blue Blood programs, as we, we should be thinking about them, because it's a quarter of a century. If you look at a quarter of a century body of work, yeah, pretty impressive. Now... Villanova may be right back out of it because of the fact that Jay Wright's gone and Kyle Neptune can't find his way into the tournament anymore. You know, that is a that's a huge issue that we that we're looking at with Villanova is that no, maybe it was just Jay Wright. Maybe it was Jay Wright because they weren't good from, you know, Raleigh Massimino. They had what the uh, the Kerry Kittles run in the tournament. And then that was but that wasn't even a final four berth. If I, I think they don't, I think they only made it to the Sweet Sixteen with Kerry Kittles at Villanova. But they, it was like you went from 1985, and then it wasn't till Jay Wright no Jay really Wright got his hooks in, yeah. in in the early 2000s that you sit there and you go, all right, that is, now Villanova basketball mm-hmm. is back to being competitive again. It's not even close. It's it's UConn right mm-hmm. now. Like Dan Hurley's cutting a wrestling promo, but he's not wrong. He's not wrong. Like he was talking a whole heap of crap, but he wasn't wrong. It's just that nobody ever says it out loud. But it, is he more right on this that he had at the podium? I just think it, 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 it's it's the best two year run I think in a very very long time, just because uh, of everything we lost from last year's team. Um, to lose that much, and, and uh, again to do what we did again. Uh, you know, it, it's got to be as two uh, as, 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 as impressive a two year run as a program's had uh, since prior to whoever did it before Duke. Um, to me, it is more impressive than what Florida and Duke did um, b- because they brought back their entire teams, and you know we, we uh, you know we lost <laughs> we lost some major players. All right, so what he is saying: the last two year run, back to back national titles, first time we've seen it since oh six oh seven. In these last two seasons, they are 68 and 11 to win their back to back national titles. You go back to the previous back to back national title winners in, um, in Florida. F- Florida, where they, I'm trying to figure out, they're, they're all screwed up. Um, but if you go back to Billy Donovan running that ship there in their two years, uh, they went 33 and 6, 35 and 5. So they were 68 and 11. Mm-hmm. Identical record. Mike Shashevsky at Duke, when he went back to back, which is the, the next previous one, they went 68 and 9. They played two less games. Cowards. Yeah. 91 92 is a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But when you think about it, like this probably is up there. the most dominant run since we've seen. John Wooden at UCLA, yeah. and and it is uh, even more so because of the the state of college basketball. I think that that is what makes it exponentially more impressive. Yeah, because you you look at those teams that Florida had, and you you had not just multiple NBAers, you had multiple like very good NBA players, and Horford and Noah. 
Horford, Horford still playing. They had Al Horford, Joe Kim Noah, Corey Brewer, Joe or uh, Torian Green, Torian Green, and a cup and then of coffee. Lee Humphreys was yeah. the, was the fifth who, one who had a, a cup of coffee as well. And like, they th- those all five of those guys came back came back for the to run it back and to repeat. UConn had to do it with a Entirely completely different set uh, of starters. You had three. Well, Clean was the back. Three last of year. five of your starters had to be replaced mm-hmm. this year. That's incredible to go through and to do that in this era of college basketball where you had you hit strike when the iron's hot, boom, your ass is in the portal. National championship or not. Yeah. You know, you you usually will see uh, those guys say, Hi, right, how much money am I gonna make? Or a coach goes and takes off for greener pastures. And Dan Hurley is saying no on all accounts, mm-hmm. which is incredible that you can keep those guys in and say, you're not leaving. And coach and, them hard. And to be an a-hole like he is. Because he's a And guys don't want to leave. Yeah, he's a red ass of red asses. And he gets after you. Like, if you, this is what he's doing in public, imagine what he's doing when the cameras are off. I actually, I want to see that. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? like I'm 100%. He, he's I a, he's see a that. guy who he gets after guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, this isn't Bobby Knight, but like. He gets after guys. It's not a it's not a gentle coddling of players. It's hard coaching. Yeah. And that's what every guy has talked about with him. And boy, he can one up his brother. He, his brother may have won back to back when he was at Duke, but mm. he won back to back as a coach. Yeah. Meanwhile, Arizona State can't get up off the mat. <laughs> is that better than going back to back as a player? I think so. I think it is. It's harder it, it's it's much harder to do because you're not in charge as many things as a player. You you just get out there and you play and you work. As a coach, there's so many variables that you can't control. And as as a coach, you have to make sure the ship is still steered in the right direction, and that's going to be the hardest part as uh, UConn tries to go for three in a row, which we have not seen since the great John Wooden won from 1967 through 1975. <laughs> It's even before Jeff Rust. <laughs> that is wild. Or, excuse me, 67 to 73, not 75. 67 mm. to 73. I, Sorry, two extra championships yeah. I got in there. He ended up winning in 64 and 65, though. So he won 64, 65, didn't win on 66. What Coward. a bum. And then went 67 to 73. And that's eight of nine national titles. Yeah, go ahead and take UCLA. a look and see who was on those teams. They were pretty good. It's like three Hall of Famers. On Plus, both, they had on a pyramid. They had a pyramid of success, and John Wooden had a bag man. Mm-hmm. Like, he had... He, There's no way he, they would have paid those players he, back then. John Wooden may have had the OG bag man. Like, it was... And they, they went to great lengths to protect that. <laughs> Not John Wooden. He would never. Not he would the great, never. Because he had the pyramid of success, which what you didn't see was the buried layer of the pyramid, which is the base, and that's a bag of cash. It's in in and out bags. And as Matt Painter eloquently put it, it's like everybody thinks that uh, NIL means the best programs are going to get the best players. Let's be honest with ourselves. That's been happening for decades. Going back and looking at those title teams, there's not one yet that doesn't have five NBA players on it. Oh, really? <laughs> Are you kidding? There we go. Found one. And it was Sidney Wicks, Curtis Rose, Steve Patterson, Henry Bibby. All right. We got we got a text here at 503-864-6326, Vancouver Ford text line. When the numbers eventually come out about this men's tournament, I think a lot of people are going to be in the same place. Mm -hmm. Next on the fan. What's your opinion? It's big.
a little bit, but Ian Eagle felt right on the call. I thought the pregame show and postgame shows are awesome when you have, you know, Ernie and Charles Barkley out there. You see Charles dapped up every Purdue player on the way out. Yeah, you know, I thought Barkley was really good in general. He, he, you know, as goofy as he is, he genuinely gives a damn about basketball and likes yeah. college basketball, and I like that he's there for that. And I think Jet and Clark Kellogg, they bring the analysis. Yeah. And then Chuck is Chuck, yeah. and Ernie is a great navigator. The one thing I do not like about the Final Four is it's on TBS. Yeah, it's it's it, it's a choice. It's hard. It's hard to find it. Mm-hmm. Like everybody knew, and the women's game will get a bigger number. Yeah. Oh, Big, the storylines leading into it were an all timer. Well, it was on ESPN. Yeah. It's easier to find. It's it's easier to find. Um, P. One Tyler says I watch more of Monday Night Raw than I did the championship game. Raw after Mania is always great. The, and I think that a lot of people are. <laughs> Are gonna go down that road because it when it's not on CBS. I thought it was on CBS. Hell, I went to CBS. I I, I told my kid. I was like, he's like, what channel? It's like seven oh six. Wrong. Mm. Boom. It was on TBS, and you have to go and you have to hunt. It's not hard to do. No, but it for casuals, it, it's a lot where people are like, meh, eh, whatever. I think you can. It can be on TBS or TNT or whatever, if the storylines match what. You had with the women's side. Yeah, it was it, crazy. If you if you had one of the best of all time for whatever, I, I don't again, I don't think you're gonna get this on the men's side, somebody chasing that kind of record because the level of good that you have to be to break Maravich's and now Caitlin Clark's scoring records, I don't think that guy exists in college basketball at the highest of levels. Like he never will. What hilariously, uh Antoine Davis with the Rip City remix was two points off of Maravich's record. At Detroit Mercy. Second, he was the second all-time leading men's scorer. Yeah, but he's at Detroit Mercy. But it's the thing, like that's what I'm saying. You you might get somebody who gets there, but it won't have the storyline, and nobody's. Yeah. It's not going to have the same kind of force because no. if you're that good, you're league. You're gone. You're it, going to the NBA. So it, I I think the storylines are going to be a little bit different. But let's let's fast forward a year, 2025 in the NCAA final, and it's just for S's and G's. It's Cooper Flag and Duke against pick your team. Arkansas, Kentucky, pew, pew, UConn. UConn. Yeah. That number is going to be bonkers because everybody's tuned yeah. in to see what that, that actually looks like. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen, and it doesn't happen all that often because freshmen don't typically get there. But I think it's interesting to compare and contrast the two across the, the cable networks. But, yeah, I, I think there's there's certainly something to the fact that not having it be on network television is a little bit weird. And I'm wondering if in, in the next ongoing media landscape, as we kind of push back to over the air and more traditional methods along with streaming, if we don't see that come back around. I just don't like, I haven't gone to the superstation for a game since the Atlanta Braves in the nineties, if I'm being honest, like I don't go to TBS for sports. It's not in the repertoire, even though it's like one click up from TNT where Oh, like we're dumb animals. Yeah, I live on we're, TNT. We're all trained to go. We have our routines and our stations that we watch for sports. Mm-hmm. And the TBS is not one. No. Like putting it on TNT would have been a far better move yeah. for Turner Sports. What did they do. have go against last night? Oh, I would probably say Charmed. No, it's in the morning. Uh, it's probably some sort of Avengers. It was, it was, it was, it was or pro- John Wick. It was, it was probably a movie. Last it night. was probably Endgame because when I was at the gym, it was. Uh, Infinity War. I have a feeling like I feel feeling this happened to a lot of people, but maybe it was just me. Mm. Closing seconds of the game, did your TV glitch at all? Because my feed did. I don't know. Froze. For final seconds, like when Andrew Hurley had a turnover. Oh, really? Froze. Done. Like he had to take. His dad was yelling at him, and I was like, yes, this is fantastic. A guy who never plays, who's the coach's son, and his dad was pressuring him to take a shot clock violation, and his one statistic in the national championship mm. game will be turnover. Doesn't actually count as a turnover. It's a team turnover. Oh, well, good. Not an individual stat. Players good. don't seem to understand that one. That one's a weird one. He's good. got a trillion. Mm. He went. He had the O for line right there. Yeah, he had trillion. One. Trillion. A trillion, one. it's when you get... One minute and zero and zeros. zeros all Club yeah. trill, bro. There's mm-hmm. a lot of trillions on there. A lot of trillions on trill the dude. on the on the board last night because empty the bench. Trill Donovan. Mm-hmm. Trilly. Oh my god. Okay. 
No, nothing. Okay. Nothing. Nothing at all. You're not in Club Trill? No. Uh all right, panic alert um for one team, but let's take a let's take a, a little gander at the NFL. We are 16 days away from mm. the National Football League draft and teams got to be knocking it out of the park. Danny Dusty on the fan.
Breaking news on the fan is brought to you by BetQL Smarter Bet. Start with BetQL. Download the BetQL app or visit BetQL.com today. Oh, boy. Jake Hedberg, BeaverBlitz.com, is reporting. Multiple sources indicate that Oregon State All-American running back Damian Martinez intends to enter the transfer portal when it opens next week. The transfer portal... It will open on April 16th. We already have a host of guys that are are saying that, you know, they intend to uh, enter the portal. I think yesterday it was, was it Marcus Harper for Oregon? Um, in, it, we, there was that report that he intended to enter the uh, transfer portal from, from the Ducks. Um, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's who it was. Um, and now, so you're going to have guys that, that are going to start popping up and uh, entering the transfer portal. And look, this is this is tough sledding right now for Oregon State. This is the death blow because remember everything that Damian Martinez said following the departure of Jonathan Smith. I'm staying. I'm sticking around. I'm, I'm Oregon State through and through, all that stuff. And then... Look, calmer heads prevail. Reality settled in. You're settling in on on looking down the roster at spring ball, and you you say, "Oh boy, not it." Look, this sucks for Oregon State fans. There, there's there's no other way around it. I mean, this is brutal for Oregon State. Yeah. You have an All American running back who who planted his flag in the ground and adamantly said that he was he wanted to be a part of Trent Bray and the Beavs moving forward in in year one with Trent Bray. And for this to happen, man, it sucks. I don't blame Damian Martinez one bit. He's got to do, he's got to look out for himself. He's got to do what's best for him. I think that every transfer and every college athlete has got to look at it in those terms. He gave everything he had to Oregon State, but look, sometimes you take a look around at, at the room and you say, "I got to look out for me and my future too." And this sucks for Beaver fans um, all around, man. This is brutal news for the Beavs. Yeah, I don't really think there's a way you can get around it. It's just, it, no. this is the nature of that beast, and it sucks because uh, this is now on top of the two women's transfers, and there's reportedly more coming there, the the men's, which isn't nearly as impactful because they were terrible. But this is, I mean, this this is the last guy on the football team. Everybody else is gone. But, uh, you got Gray, the offensive lineman, who is probably not far behind him. I yeah. mean, th- that's the reality of it. Yeah. That that is you were hoping that they that with the money that they found and the way things were going with some of the reporting as far as the super conference and maybe Oregon State finding a way back in and all these other things that they could just hold on. Yeah. And I just how how and again, I don't fault any of these kids. Not one of them. You gotta do what you gotta do. Yep. But it's just it's it sucks for the beefs. Yeah. That's 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 the gist of it. Dems the breaks, man. And look. Martinez as a player, somebody's gonna get rich off that guy. Yeah. Man, that that young man is a workhorse back. His NFL potential is through the roof. He is a projected first like first back off the board, uh, heading into next year's NFL draft. He's a special one, man. He is he is truly special. And now you look at all right, so what does Oregon State have left in the cupboard? Um you got Jam Griffin, who he showed his flashes, but to have a one-two punch, Griffin would be that second punch that is that makes a backfield electric. Anthony Hankerson and Isaiah Newell, uh, those are the three running backs that are scholarship running backs that that remain on Oregon State's roster right now. And for anything that you could say about the the momentum that Trent Bray could build in this first year of the unknown that Oregon State is entering, this is a death blow, man. This is a, a brutal one, especially with all the skill positions that they lost uh, to the portal and obviously your quarterback room uh, being decimated as well. Damian Martinez not being in that backfield is 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 brutal for him. And now you look at, all right, what does this look like moving forward? Um with Oregon state in what does the future look like for this offense? Because there's tough decisions uh, that are going to be made by the remaining players, but you look at the schedule and the way that it it shakes out Purdue, 
You've got UNLV, which had a great year last year and uh, kind of made a surge. Cal is always a tough out no matter what, and they're they're on to greener pastures in the ACC. Washington State and Boise State uh, on the schedule for next year. That's not the easiest schedule in the world for the Beavs to navigate, especially when you're having to break in so many new positions and so many new uh, players to the system. Yeah, I mean, you're looking for the silver lining and – Maybe I'm I'm not looking hard enough. I just I I don't. There isn't. I, I, there's just nothing there. Like, God, this is gonna sound horrible. I mean, how much further ahead of Portland State are you? A lot. Uh, you're still miles. You're miles. You're miles. Miles. Miles and miles on ahead. the roster right now. Yes. Miles. Okay, wait. I mean, it's not even close. Mm. I mean, that one is not. It's not even a question. Okay, there. I'll trust you on that. Yeah. How much of an indictment though is this on Bray? I don't think it's don't an indictment on, yeah. on Bray. I think it is he took a look around and went, I I see what I see what left. I see what's coming back. And how how he he good soldiered at the beginning. And I, I think it helped hold together what they had of a recruiting class. Um but I, I'm not i I'm I'm not I just if you are an Oregon State fan now you're sitting there and you're going, all right, is Josh Gray going to be the next that next guy to bolt? Is Grant Stark going to be a guy who takes off and does he bolt? It's this is this is tough because look, your quarterbacks are Ben Goldbranson, and then um you got the the kid from Idaho who transferred in. Um he's really good. Yeah, was it uh Giovanni McCoy? McCoy. Yeah, and he can he's got some wiggle to his game. He'll move around, run around. He was a he big was reason why they were good at Idaho. I only watched a couple of games of theirs when they were like in the playoffs and they'd throw them on at, you know, eight o'clock at night kickoffs in the FCS playoffs, but uh, they made it to the quarterfinals and it's there's no way to put it. This is gonna be a a brutal dredge uphill for Trent Bray and his staff. And like the the guy I feel worse for is uh Ryan Gunderson, who's former beef, was down at UCLA with Chip, comes up, takes the offense coordinator job at Oregon State. And when you have a back like Damian Martinez, that's your it's that's your basis. That's yeah. your that's your focal point of how you're turning this thing around. Remember the other offensive linemen that they brought in were they brought in two guys from Colorado last year. And Colorado's offensive line was a disaster. They may be big, but that was an absolute disaster of an offensive line. Now you're not going to be playing a full Pac-12 schedule, but you got some really tough games against some pretty damn good programs, um, and you're going to have to put that together. You know that in that to me, Danny, when you're talking about like how far off are you from like Portland State, the the reason why they are miles away, uh, miles ahead, Colorado started three and zero. And <laughs> remember that. That's fair. That's like, fair. I mean. The talent of an FBS player, whether they are kickbacks from another school or whatever, you are you're still starting yeah. That wasn't your, fair to lump with Portland State, but at the same point, it was just like the, the I can't. I mean, we we see exoduses. This is this Bad. is something entirely different. Yeah, like th- this is with the exception again of Gray, who may or may not also go. There's nobody left that you're sitting there going, yeah, that's a that's a power five guy you know what i mean like where you're like that's a dude that you can count on it's yeah. and that sucks I, yeah. I i don't i i hate seeing that for oregon state yeah it's brutal um you know you do have the bright spot of you still got top five baseball program in the country man and they're really damn good hopefully that doesn't end up being a thing that that, that falls apart all right sorry uh b fans that's that's a that's a gut punch right there that's a death blow uh, Damian Martinez entering the transfer portal, uh, according to uh, Beaver Blitz of 24-7 Sports. Um, coming up next, we've got, let's go down to the Masters, Augusta. Mm. The author of Drive, about Tiger Woods and his quest uh, to continue playing competitive golf, is Bob Herrick, Sports Illustrated golf writer. He joins us next, Danny and Dusty on The Fan.
Joining us now is the author of Drive, a new book out and in bookstores. Uh, Bob Herrick joins us now. Bob, thanks for taking a few minutes for us, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And happy happy Masters Week to you. I know it's an exciting time yeah. for everybody that loves the, the sport of golf. Yeah, it is. It's uh, you know, it's it's for a lot of people. It's even though I'm dealing with it all the time. For a lot of people, this is kind of the real start of golf. You know, a lot of the country doesn't isn't isn't you know that hasn't had good weather, and they they just sort of view now NCAA basketball is over and. You know, baseball's just started, and they see golf is just starting. So uh, it's uh, – and it usually doesn't disappoint either. So it's a, it's a great week. You know, as we enter Masters Week and, and you have your new book out, Drive, The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods, um, this is an incredible time. I can't believe it's been five years since since Tiger last won his green jacket. But now we, we fast forward to this, and this could be a record-setting event for Tiger Woods. How, how do you feel about Tiger in that quest to make his 24th consecutive cut at Augusta National when everything has kind of been going against Tiger as his body's been fighting back against him? Yeah, look, it's a, I think it's a great example of what I was trying to capture in that book. You know, um, it's, it's not the be-all, end-all record of his career. It's not something that you set out to do necessarily um, missing cuts is part of golf you know it happens every week guys miss cuts a lot of name players have missed a lot of cuts but to make it every year as a pro uh, to this point for Tiger despite some of the things he's been through you know they they don't always have the game some years aren't good some weeks aren't good and to make it every time and to, to try to, to, to make it here this week especially to get that record would just be sort of another little thing that you add to a long list of accomplishments that to me sort of points out his drive, you know, his resiliency. He, he, he has, an, he, his mind works differently than most of ours. It's hard for us to not, um, you know, rationalize things in our lives. Maybe we think we should get out and exercise today and we come up with a reason not to, you know, well, I did it yesterday. I've been good this week or, you know, I'm kind of tired. It, 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 Tiger never did that. You know, he, he always kind of fought through those negative thoughts, and and that's why I think he has the record that he has. It's, it goes beyond his talent and ability. Bob, on, on that point, you kind of have a, a unique uh, lens to kind of view this thing through, covering him from the beginning of his pro career until now and multiple sit-downs with him. You talk about the mentality, but what if, what's the thing that you've seen change in him throughout his professional career? Well, while the mentality has always been there, what about his, his, his personal growth has stood out to you, whether it's through injury or, or off the course or uh, conquering some demon on the course? Like what, what is the, kind of the prevailing thing that has stood out to you uh, over the course of his career? Well, I think as time went on, he, you know, there was a maturity level. Um, you know, he softened a little bit, not so much in his resolve, but in his dealings with people. You know, he, he, he let himself be revered. He let himself be uh, accepted and cheered. And, you know, in the early days, he never did that. You know, he had blinders on. He was, <laughs> you know, the first 10 years of his career, you know, he didn't sign many autographs. He didn't look at many people in the crowd. Um, and, and that evolved. You know, and he found, and and I think what, especially five years ago, six years ago, when he was coming back from the surgery, the spinal fusion, you know, he allowed the fans to embrace him, and he embraced that. I think it helped him. You know, I, I think he, that I think it fueled him in some ways. I think he appreciated the support, and and they're they're backing him meant a lot. When as before, you know, he was just sort of oblivious to it. We're talking with Bob Herrick, who has a new book out, Drive, The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods. This isn't the first uh, book involving Tiger that you've written either. You have uh, the book out, Tiger and Phil, as well. And you've covered him for so long, and everybody in the golf world has covered him for so long. And I, there was a comment that he had that when the question was asked to him yesterday, it, it stuck with me because I knew you were coming on today, and I wanted to ask you about this because – when he was asked why he keeps coming back to compete, he just said, I just love golf. Have you in this time 
where Tiger has has been the face of golf. Ever question whether or not he actually loved the the game of golf? Yes, absolutely. I I've wondered that at times. <clears throat> I think he probably does now. He appreciates it more now. You know, his son plays. He sees the joy his son gets. I think he wants to be an example for him. I think that's one of the reasons Tiger wants to keep playing, you know, to be that example for him, to give him something to watch. But, you know, I think there were times, especially when things were rough, um, you know, when he went through the marital strife, uh, you know, what, 14, 15 years ago now, when he went through some of the injuries, um, I'm not sure that he loved golf. You know, I, 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 I think, and I think there might have been some times when he was at the height, you know, like the 2004, 5, 6, 7 time period. You know, he'd been playing for 10 years, 8, eight years, always expected to win. Um, <clears throat> you just wonder if, was it a job? Was it like, I'm expected to do this? I'm expected to, to win? It's got to get old to, to like, if you don't, if you finish second or third, be viewed as, as coming up short. <laughs> You know, and, and you just wonder, I mean, I think someday I wonder if he'll delve into those topics because I think it's interesting. It's an interesting question. He says, I, because I love golf. I mean, you have to, I think, to put yourself through some of the things he's done here over the last several yeah. years, you know, but, but, but I don't always know if he did at times at other points in his career. Do you think at this point in time, and I know it's kind of weird to even question this, but do you think he has enough magic in that tank to do something special this weekend? I would say that if he, if he had been playing a little bit more, if he had played two or three events this year and mm-hmm. had a little bit of form and, and was able to knock off some of the competitive rust, um, it's just very hard to be sharp if you haven't been playing inside the ropes. I mean, Tiger can hit a lot of balls. He can chip and putt as much as his body allows. But when you're chipping and putting at home, does it really mean anything? Yeah. You know, when you get out here on the first or second hole on Thursday and you miss a green and you've got this tough chip and you need to hit that thing precise, can you? I mean, you know, it, it, it's because you haven't done it that much, you know. And so that's the thing. I mean, I don't put anything by him. He said today, even he said, look, you know, if everything aligns, if everything aligns, I think I've got one more in me. If everything aligns, okay, that means his health has to be good. That means his leg has to be okay. That means his back doesn't go out. That probably means the weather cooperates. It also means that his short game is sharp. It also probably means that he gets some breaks. You know, there's a lot, a lot of things there that have to go right. I think you got to take it one step at a time. I hate to use the cliche, but, you know, let's see how he does for a round. And then, you know, if he can have a good first round and he's feeling good, well, then maybe some confidence builds. I hope, hey, I hope for the drive. I, I hope he does win for it. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll send those bad boys flying off the shelves even more than they already are. But uh, we, you mentioned Charlie, his son, and we see – Tiger, whether it's him caddying for his kid or just, you know, proud dad walking behind him. And I think that's kind of something that, you know, people that have been fans of golf for a long time, we we, we remember every shot of Tiger on a tee box and in those big moments, Earl was standing, you know, behind him or he was there waiting for him to walk off the 18th um, green. And we also know how hard uh, Earl Woods was on on Tiger growing up, and how it, he wanted to ingrain that kind of militaristic style of of to maybe help that drive. What are you seeing with the way that Tiger's handling Charlie, and kind of the the ways that it is similar and maybe different? Yeah, I mean, I think he he recognizes that um, uh, <clears throat> you know that that it's it's tough to be the son of a great athlete, and I think he's tried to to give him you know, a lot of space and allow him to flourish on his own. Uh, if, you, if you've seen those, those uh, PNC tournaments that they played in together now a few times, it's uncanny the man, how the mannerisms are the same. <clears throat> you know, Charlie, you know, plucks the tee out of the ground the w- same way Tiger does. He marks his ball the same way. He sniffles his nose the same way. I mean, it, it, the swing is similar. It's really kind of neat. You know, but yeah. I think Tiger's allowing him to, you know, I don't get the sense that Tiger's pushing him at all. 
Um, he, he's talked, you know, obviously very reverentially about his own dad and how he helped his career. But, you know, the thing I keep reminding people of is that at this age that Charlie is, he's 14, 15 years old now, um, Tiger had already accomplished a lot. Mm-hmm. He was somewhat famous. Like, Tiger at this age is being recruited to colleges as a freshman in high school. I mean, it's just kind of like <clears throat> to think that Charlie, you know, Charlie's nowhere near that realm yet. He's a very, very good golfer, but I don't think he's not, you know, it, it, it's almost like it's even hard to talk about because I think he's, he's got a lot of growing to do still. He's got to, he's going to get bigger. And, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, still a ways to go for him before, uh, before we, we see, uh, and, and can make a, a judgment about, about where he's, where he's going. Bob, I'm always interested in the, in the, in the writing process of, of, of books like this, where, you're you're covering such a timeline. What's what's something that didn't make the book or the cutting room floor, or just a a, a moment or an anecdote that um, from Tiger's career that, that stands out to you that just didn't make the book? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I thought I covered most of it. What I didn't get into a lot of was when he, uh, uh, I didn't do a deep dive on his amateur career, mm. um, and and certainly that's <clears throat> part of his story too, part of his drive. I try to make the argument in this book uh, that that his legacy is about more than just the great skill and talent and victories. He, you, you don't win as much as he has without all those things, but it, it also you don't win as much as he has without having this inner fortitude to push through and get it done. I mean, how do you win a U.S. Open ba- barely able to walk mm-hmm. yeah. like he did in 2008? How do you make 142 straight cuts? It's just inevitable. Guys are going to miss cuts. I use this example all the time. As of right now, Tiger has missed 23 cuts worldwide in his career. He's been playing for 27 years as a pro, something like that. Turned pro in 1996. <laughs> I think that's 27 years. Jordan Spieth, and I'm not picking on Jordan, okay? I'm just It's just the number I picked out because Jordan is a great player. He's won three majors, and he's what? He's about 18 years younger than Tiger, and he's missed 45. 45. He's Good missed God, almost geez. double the number that Tiger has missed in his entire career. I mean, how do you do that? And most of Tigers have come in the last 10 years when he's been hurt. You know, Tiger went seven years without missing a cut. Sometimes you just don't have it. Sometimes on Friday afternoon, you're too over the cut line. Your back's bothering you. You've been on the road for a couple of weeks. you are like, man, I really need to work on my game. or I'd like to see the family start thinking about the flights out of there. You get home, I'll work on my game at home, and, and you just kind of mail it in. Tiger never did that. I mean, and clearly, you know, obviously he was in contention a lot, but clearly there were weeks of it. And he grinded it out to make the cut, and he always had a great line. <clears throat> you, can't make, you can't win the tournament if you don't make the cut. <laughs> That's perfect. That is perfect. I mean, we remember, you're, you're talking about his amateur career, and like out here, we have like I remember growing up, and I grew up out in Hillsboro where Pumpkin Ridge Golf Course is. In 1996, when he won the U.S. Amateur, it was, there was like this buzz around the area of you guys need to check out this Tiger Woods kid. He's he's right down the road, and then n- nobody quite could comprehend what it would turn into from that moment on. And as you look at the world of golf right now, we've had stars come through. But whether it was you had Arnie and Jack for so long, and now you have Tiger Woods with this staying power, do you think that there is somebody that can have the staying power that Tiger Woods? Because the world of golf has gotten so much better around the PGA Tour as well. That will be a name and a face, not not equal to Tiger Woods, but can take that mantle. It's a lot to ask. He's such a unique <clears throat> character in, in in all of this. I mean. Obviously, being a minority and and it was set him apart. Also, there was a fascination just because of that. He wasn't like everybody else, and in golf, it was rare. You know, uh, we still don't have a lot of minority participation in golf. You know, there was a thought that he would help improve that, and he has, but probably not as much as people had hoped. Um, so there was that aspect to it. Then there was just like the whole. You know, the way he came up, like I was saying earlier, he was famous early. Yeah. You know, when he was in college, people went to watch him play. He won three straight U.S. juniors and three straight U.S. amps. 
he came to the pro he came to pro game with a ton of fanfare and had already signed like forty million dollars worth of deals, you know, before he ever hit a shot as a pro. There was so much hype and yet and he exceeded it, which is incredible to think about really. Um, you know, most people do not exceed exceed it. So for somebody else to do that is really asking a lot. I mean, I think somebody, you know, a guy like Rory McIlroy kind of has those qualities. And he has a great record that I think is really sort of underplayed. He's won like 23 or 24 PJ Tour events. He's won four majors. He's only 34. I mean, if he could sustain it and get into the 30s and PJ Tour wins and win another major or two, that's epic stuff, you know, especially in this day and age. Frankly, if anybody can get close to what Phil did, Phil Mickelson, 45 wins in six majors. Now that, I mean, so to, to think about what Tiger's done, I mean, I just don't see any chance. No. The other thing, the part of it is the money is so big that these guys can make so much money and, and, and be set that four or five good years, and, and you just wonder about their motivation. You know, how long are you going to keep it going? And um, uh, so I, I, I think that just it's human nature. Again, it kind of just takes away from your, you know, from your desire. I mean, you can, you don't need to play this game forever, you know. And, uh, and as you see, windows are small. I mentioned Spieth earlier, you know. It's hard to believe, but this is going to be nine years since he won the Masters. He won the U.S. Open the same year. He won the Open two years after that. He had an amazing stretch of of wins in in about four years. But since 2017, he's only won twice. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy (laughs) that these windows can be really small. Uh, And I'm not saying he's not going to go off and win ten more times. He might. But the bottom line is he hasn't won a lot lately. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's fleeting. There it can be. The book is Drive, The Lasting Legacy of Tiger Woods. Bob Herrick is the author of it. Really appreciate the time and uh it's it's an incredible um look into Tiger Woods, the competitor and the guy that we all see and you know, hopefully we see one more green jacket uh over the top of that red polo on a Sunday afternoon. Thanks for the time, Bob. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good one. You too. you too. He is such a unique character in Tiger Woods that his dominance is, it really is. It's like, it's, cartoon, it's cartoonish. It's unquestioned now, yeah. even though he doesn't have the majors record. Jack uh, still owns that record and, and will own that record. If we're, uh, if we're all being honest with ourselves, it's like a, Tiger can say, yeah. all right, I may have one more in me. It, you don't have three, yeah. you know, like in, and, and that's the thing is that it's still, everybody looks around and he, he's talking about it with Spieth and Rory. There's so many good golfers mm-hmm. now and they're never going to come close and none of them are going to come close, but it's going to make it impossible for anybody to reach the heights that he reached. Yeah. He, he changed the game. It's, it's incredible. Like we have these MJ and LeBron goat conversations. Mm-hmm. No, like, good luck. Convincing, like we'll have one person on the text line be like, "Ah, Jack is still the greatest." No, he's not. It's uh, fine. Uh, uh-uh. it's fine. <laughs> Isn't that so? It's, okay, it's fine. But his dominance is is something completely different. Yeah, than no, what we have in other that, sports. I think I think we're we're reaching that like across a lot of different sports for sure. It's because of what he talks about the money, mm-hmm. the the motivation. Just you got to be built different. Like LeBron's worth a half billion dollars in in contracts alone, but He's still there. There's plenty of other guys who've gotten paid that have been like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, exactly. I'm good. So, all right, coming up next, our worst day on the web. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to say this other than this is one of the more terrifying things I've ever heard. But first, is Big Will Betts with a sports center update.
sucks. You know, sometimes I've come across these stories and I go, that can't be real. <laughs> because it's terrifying. The headline reads, Sierra Leone declares emergency after addicts dig up graves to get high on drug made from human bones. Wait. Wait, Sierra Leone, the country of Sierra Leone, yes. is, is a in a state of emergency? Uh, you don't declare this after one, one. grave robbery. This yeah. is happening... Throughout the country? Yeah. Police officers are now guarding cemeteries to thwart disturbing practice of exhuming skeletons for the zombie drug. Oh. My. TikTok's hottest new trend, baby. Uh, grave robbing? Uh, huffing bones and getting high. What? In Are you the serious? World? No. I just, okay. I, I, I thought it was. It like, seems oh my like God. it's like the Tide Pod challenge. Yeah. No. It's so Nyquil pizza. So, like, for what people are wondering, like, it's it's apparently it's a high. It, it's it lasts several hours and can be uh, entirely hypnotic. It's. It sounds like. Yeah, it's a rotting corpse. Yeah. It's it's uh, synthetic Kush with ground bones. That is absolutely disgusting. And what the, would make somebody be like, you know what I should well, do? Grind bones. See, but the, we we have this conversation, but at the same time, it's like, what would make a person do meth, or what would make a person do heroin, or, or crocodile, or or crack, or coke, or cro crocodile that makes you turn into an alligator? It's because you are an addict, and you are to the point where you're always chasing a high at that point or a different high or the longevity of one. And I, for the life of me, I don't know what gets people to just be like, yep, this is where I'm going to, this is, this is the path I'm going down. And nobody has that, that thought of, Hey, you know what? Not only is this, um, morally wrong that we're robbing a grave but it's really disgusting guys like nobody's sitting yeah. there and saying ha having that conversation of like hey you realize that like we're grinding up grammy's bones here but also i mean are they being sanitary are they boiling the there's bones? and no there is no way that they are being sanitary about They're not this. boiling the bones and didn't tupac no. and his buddies do this isn't like when he died didn't they smoke his ashes i mean that's not this I mean, what's the difference? Because it's you're cooked. cremated, and that's also a weird move. It's also super weird. Uh, that's not, I'm not agree. I have never smoked not, anyone's ashes. I'm not trying coward. to normalize this as you know what Tupac's buddies were right. You know they uh, should have. I'm just saying it might not just only be a Sierra Leone issue. Oh man, I imagine it's not. But also, like again, just the the science behind this. One, the bone has not been smoked yet. Just stewed. That's a Do we know that this job. is because we have a uh, we have this text on the Vancouver Ford text line. This is literally stupider stupider than smoking banana peels. Bones do not get you high. It's a placebo psycho effect. And I'm I'm willing. Well, they're doing this with some, in in a combination with other drugs. Okay, but is it truly or is it a placebo effect? Like they're putting it on another synthetic drug yeah. and they're saying like maybe the com the chemical reaction gets you super stoned. This sounds, I I'm willing to put money on the fact that the people that are doing this, they truly are dumb enough to, to think that it is actually working and it is a placebo effect. I, I I'll, 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 I'll agree with that. Bro science. Um, a great one for Matt in Vancouver as well in the text line. I believe this is how the zombie apocalypse starts. You're not wrong. Uh, we're trending down this down this path. I saw Costa Rica has got a fly a flesh eating fly larva issue going on down there. We've got uh, now uh, bone smoking, which is a thing in Sierra Leone. And now and with Kush this, is not not what you think it is over there. The it's the combination of uh, weed, fentanyl, tramadol, and oh, formaldehyde. Yeah, these all these all sound like a great idea. Yeah. So just throw a bone in there, and and all of a sudden it's really ramped up. Mm -hmm. I don't know how a bone does get you high, to be honest. How does it? Never smoked I, bone. I'm, I think I'm with the texture on these people are just that dumb sure. that they're going to commit a litany of crimes in, you know. 
rip apart a corpse, and it's not doing them any good. Yeah. Golly. Just a incredibly terrifying thing. Oh, man. Well, we can go from being disgusted and absolutely freaked out about that to being uh, really mad about uh, something else, oh, too. What do we got? Well, we're getting worry. big mad? We're going to get big mad, and Let's I think we can big. all collectively come together over this. We'll oh. get to that and more coming up here on Danny and Dusty, Danny the Fan. It's, um, well, we're all mad about inflation, right? 
Inflation sucks. Uh, yes. It's terrible. Uh, yes. Every time I go grocery shopping, it's like $100 more than it used to be three years ago. I, I want to kill somebody every single time. I've noticed, and I may be crazy on this, maybe I'm just hunting deals now, mm. but I've noticed that the at the grocery store, it's a little bit better than it was. Maybe I don't have the options of the uh, QVC or the uh, Winco. Yeah, well. Don't hate on Winco. Winco's I'm not great. hating. I'm saying I don't have the option. No, I'm, I'm talking beer. even at the old uh, Safeway there. It, I, I'm starting to mm. see some deals to be had again. They're it's not, not the, as they're, it's they're not, not as big of the a old kick in the Fred nuts. Meyer. Yeah, that's true. It's a little kick in the teeth. That is very true. Uh, it's also not there in the uh, fast food world. Fast food world. Uh, this is from Finance Buzz. The actual inflation between 2014 and 2024 is 31 percent. The closest companies that have maintained a level of of rational inflation commensurate Mm -hmm. at least closely subway and starbucks at 39 percent oh okay to get to the very top where mcdonald's is at 100 percent dude it is wild when you go there and you try to get like a egg mcmuffin meal blown away it's like 850 i'm actually shocked because i would if you would have put a gun to my head i would have said one of taco bell or burger king oh burger king is an expensive one too but because of the because of the commercials bro my turd kid was like, I want to go to BK. Have it your way. And I was like, uh, you do not rule because this is very expensive now. Uh, it, that one was eye-popping to see. And this is, look, this should not be a surprise because the Americans are fat, dumb, and stupid, right? Mm-hmm. And so what we are doing is we're just like, yeah. It's still a bargain to go to the fast food place. It's not anymore. Like we went, if you could go to a local restaurant and you can almost eat for the exact same price as going to a fast food joint now. A lot of them. From what that says yeah. right there, what is the what is the percentage on Mickey D's? McDonald's is 100%. 100% inflation. 100, rate? 100% inflation since 2014 over 10 years. Like you can go you you honestly can. You can go to a local restaurant and you can get a a Deal that is just as good. I can and go the to food five. Is five way guys. better. I could go to Five Guys. Uh, five Guys is still really also expensive. Really but also, really so so some some love me some Five Guys. So fi- some price comparisons. Mm. McChicken was a dollar. Now it's three. Taco Bell's beefy five layer burrito. Yeah, eighty nine cents is now three sixty nine. So good too. That's the problem. But the thing is, like Taco it's Bell so used to good. be a cheap place. You can't get out of there for less than fifteen bucks. No, <laughs> try thirty. It's nuts. It's wild. It's absolutely insane when you like the, the simple one here is we talked about this one off air. When we were younger, five dollar foot long at Subway. That's right. Now you get a six dollar six inch. Well, you didn't, I was even have to, say. you didn't even have to be like when we were young. Like that's not even a back in my day. They I were remember hocking, they were hawking the the five dollar foot long like a few years ago. Wasn't Mike Trout pitching the five five dollar foot long? Yeah. The danger witch. That's where they went wrong. They invested money in that ass hat. And now, then it became $7. Yeah. The Ciara right. tax. <laughs> that was the, the, <laughs> the dumb player tax. It's the same one the Broncos are paying right oh now. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, this is good to keep an eye. This is a consumer watch that you got there. That's that's a good one because I am very upset about that. Because the convenience, they're, they're on to us, the convenience of... Like most of us are going because we're in a pinch, right? You, you're short on time. You don't have a lot of places to go. You boom. You got to get something, get it quick. And now we're getting yeah, gouged. It's just maybe we should make this a, a weekly segment. Our consumer report. Just did it. Did it. Did it. Did it. Yeah. Check in. Let's do yeah. it. All right. Yeah. We'll Mark, do we'll it. Market watch. Check-in. Make you smarter as you listen to Danny and Dusty. That's right. Yeah. That's, That's right. Or at least dollar more angry. store. Still a dollar twenty-five. No, that dollar- doesn't. That doesn't add up. No, do- hey, this is going to be a surprise it to you. It does when you start shopping there every once the in a while. The dollar store, everything in that store used to be $1, Will. Mm, I understand that, but a dollar twenty-five for like Don't four primes, it's pretty dope. They have a $5 section now, too. Okay, look at that. That's where all the ice cream is. It's unfortunate. I, I have a buddy who swears by dollar store steaks, and I can't. It's good. I can't. You've never done it? No, I will it's not. It's good. You should. You shouldn't. You should just once. To just be clear, to you shouldn't. It's like snail. You got to try it once, or like frog. 
there's no you you've gone down the frog that. legs and escargot. See, the problem with the frog mm. was we were dumb and we just like caught the frogs out by the high school and then we cooked them and ate them. So it wasn't all that good. But I would try like legit frog. I've tried crocodile. Crocodile's good. No, crocodile's great. Yeah, yeah. alligator. Uh, Gator bites are great. Back in the day, back in the day, now, uh, Pizza Schmitza used to have a gator pizza. It'd be like one of their the specialty pies. Mm, yum. I don't think they do it anymore. But it was it was it had it, t- it, it tastes really like chicken. Good. Like I know it's always yeah, the joke, it's like but, a chewy chicken. Yeah, no, it's it's a greasier chicken. Yeah. You can go to, uh, if you're in the South or Dallas mm-hmm. area, you can go to uh, Papa Do's and get some Gator Bites. Snake? Ooh. Snake? Also oh, good. Yeah, well, see. Mm-hmm. I haven't had snake. I'm no? not a snake guy. Rabbit? Uh, yes, I've had rabbit. Yeah. Stew. Yeah. That's usually how you have rabbit, because it's kind of um, good. Duck? Yep. Quail. Very good. Yep. Quail Fezons. eggs. Qua- Qua- oh, yeah. Quail and pheasant, both very good. Yeah. All the fat birds are good. Turkey, duck, goose. Quail. Fat birds are good. Fat birds are tasty. There we go. We Same. shouldn't shame their bodies. Yeah, dang. Mm. He's a big ass boy. Mm. <laughs> That's what you say when you bring the goose to the table. Yeah. I don't All know right. that I've had goose. Goose is tasty. Never had it. Really? Sheep's Never good. Had Never had it. Lamb? Same thing, right? I don't think I've ever heard anybody say sheep. Yeah, no. Sheep or shorn he, lamb. He is loves eating. baby. Animals. I love lambs. Bah, he and loves veal. eating baby animals. Veal, especially. Oh yeah, veal's like baby deer, isn't it? Caged. That's kind of caged yeah. deer. Yeah. They lock the deer in a cage. That yeah, so doesn't can't move. Seem so healthy. Stay, so stay stay that doesn't sound healthy. I'm pretty sure I saw that on Food Inc. That's gross. <laughs> All right, coming up here on hour number three, we'll take a look at the national championship and what it may or may not tell us about the draft value of Donovan Klingon and Zach Eady. Danny and Dusty, Danny the fan.
for twitch.tv backslash 1080 and the fam. We love you. We appreciate whoop, you. Whoop. There's so, so many ways that you can uh, participate. You take it all in. Yeah. Take it all in. Or the Vancouver Ford text line, 503-864-6326, where you can chime in as well. All show long. That's right. It's open there for you. All over. And we'll we'll read it and we'll, we'll laugh at it sometimes worldwide. and shake our heads at it more often than not. Absolutely. And then there's a million things on there that we can never say. But that's the fun part. Because a lot of you are degenerates. Um, most of you Most are. of you. Most, most of, you. of you are. Yeah. Hey, I got a quick correction that I got to get for, mm. for the folks out here. Um, I said, don't quote me on it. And I knew it was the wrong name. And I was like, mm, that's why I said, don't quote me on it. Uh, Michael Wooten has entered the transfer world. He was backup offensive lineman. But that was to h- highlight the fact that what Oregon has is guys will put their name into the transfer portal now or their intention to put the, their name into the portal. It actually doesn't open until the 16th. And we'll talk about uh, Damian Martinez and his intent. But this is the time where guys will say, yeah, it's not going well. Mm. And they'll say, my, my intentions are to put the name in the portal. But it was Michael Wooten who has put his name into the portal for uh, the Oregon Ducks. This is going to happen quite a bit across the the board in college football as uh, the portal officially opens in a week. A week from today. Dun, 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 dun. (laughs) Well, uh, not a week. Just last night, in fact, the NCAA tournament uh, on the men's side uh, finished with UConn handling business against Purdue, and you had Donovan Klingon battling off against Zach Eady, 7-2 against 7-4. And uh, a lot of the uh, draft prognosticators released their new boards and uh, surprise, surprise, <gasps> there's risers from March Madness. Oh, no way. Uh, Kristen Peake at YahooSports.com now has Donovan Klingon going number five overall to the Portland Trailblazers. This is obviously pre-lottery. She's just slotting Donovan Klingon in at number five. Uh, I've seen others slot in Klingon at number five, number six, number seven. And I guess in this draft where things are incredibly flat, you can maybe make that argument. Because he's a sophomore and he's seven two, and he's got a thing that can get him on the floor, and that he's a plus rebounder and shot blocker. But I don't know, man. Like as good as that run was, and as as, as he might be a solid pro, which a solid pro in college is dominant. That's that's what happens. But I I don't see how you can keep him on the floor. He's a zero offensively. Like he's he's not as as mobile as he is for a guy that's seven two. He has almost no vertical pop, so you really can't use him as like a hard roll, lob threat kind of guy. It looked at times as if he, and defending Zach Eady is damn near impossible. He's big every, as hell everybody and over, touch. Everybody over the last couple of years has found. It is really difficult thing to do because he is big, he uses his body, but there were times where, and this is what I thought was impressive about Eady last night, is that he has looked slow and methodical, and that just doesn't translate to the NBA. Yet, I thought that Klingon would do a better job of being that guy who can eliminate some of those moves just based on his size. And look, vertically, you saw Edie had some some troubles against Klingon uh, because of his length and his size, because the the playing field was relatively level at seven four against seven foot two. But what I was surprised with was Zach Eady was sealing and getting around Klingon more than I thought he would last night because that was supposed to be the strength of Klingon as opposed to Eady is that he would be quicker and he would have the ability to more or less keep Eady in front of him. And I just didn't really see it. And I thought that Eady probably did help his draft stock because – there's so few opportunities to see him against a, another seven footer who is skilled or an NBA caliber player. And I thought Edie played a hell of a game last night. No, he did. And looking uh, through this, let's see, uh, Bleacher Report, Jonathan Wasserman has the magic taking Edie at 21 on CBS Sports. Let's see. They've got Edie going 22nd on Yahoo. We're looking at. There's so many ED references in every article now. It's unbelievable. Uh, 31st to the Raptors. So 20th to 30th. Post lottery. Okay. Okay. As it pertains to Klingon, it's anywhere from like five to nine. And again, eye of the beholder type stuff. I just I if you're in this draft, if if you're a if you're a young rebuilding team, I think you're taking the biggest swings you can find. And I don't see is no matter their size. 
I don't see neither Klingon or Edie as big swings. I see Sar as a big swing. I see Topich. I see Cody Williams. I see Tijon Saloon, the, the French, you know, quasi big wing. Uh, Cody Williams, like those are the guys I see as big swings. They're developmental guys. And if you're in this draft and you're like, well, things are flat, you know, from whatever pick to whatever pick, from four to 15. I don't understand how guys like this would be elevating when you're looking at the teams that are picking at the top. The Pistons, the Blazers, the Spurs. Mm -mm. The Wizards need everything, so whatever. But I hope they take Zach Eady or Donovan Klingon. I mean, look, the Wizards take uh, Z uh, Donovan Klingon. Great. More power More to power him. More power to you. Go, go, get, look, it, go get him, guys. Just I think they should. Great, hey, great idea. Start let that. Kling Kong to Washington. Ooh. There we go. Let's From do Yukon it. From Yukon to Washington? Yeah, let's go. Kling Kong to Washington. Yeah. They, and I want, I, I think that would be great. That's a great fit there. I think that he would be amazing and it would obviously help the Portland Trailblazers. So, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. I, looking at mock drafts right now, uh, one of the things I'm working on is, uh, is um, charting mock draft changes over basically from the beginning of this year until now to see kind of where guys are slotted at and how it changes through the cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how from now until the end, you know, the cycle, you know, we, we actually get to draft time, how you're going to see this methodical changes. And I don't understand how Donovan Klingon went from 12 through 15 to fifth in the NCAA tournament. This is, this is Zach Collins redux. That's and what we're seeing. That is a, not a game that people want, should want to play. I, the 30 plus 35 plus games should matter significantly more than the six. I thought team oriented wise, like I, I know that people were like, Don of a clean is seven foot two, didn't even rebound. I, I thought he did a hell of a job last night, though, of trying to keep Zach Eady because that was the primary goal, trying to keep Zach Eady away and off the boards. And the fact Eady had 10 rebounds, right? And it was walling Zach Eady off and pulling him away from the bucket. The offensive rebounds last night were incredible for UConn. And I think that whether you look at it's Klingon or Johnson, those guys, their goal was not to haul in the boards, but to just keep Zach Eady away from them. I think they did a really good job because when you have Cam Spencer being your leading rebounder in the national championship game, not not the best look for, you know, seven foot two Donovan Klingon, but it's what Danny Hurley asked them to do, right? And I think in that vein, maybe if you just have a guy, and, and this is to your point, though, of the, not a top five pick is the guy that you want to just do the junkyard dog work, right? Yeah. And just do what the coach has asked and do what the team needs. You need a guy who is a creator and a game changer in the top five. And maybe that just says more about where this draft is at because you said it yesterday that there are five guys that will be at the top of next year's draft that would probably be number one this year. And that, yeah. I think I think the rise of Klingon is probably more geared towards what we're seeing as this draft class is just not very good. Yeah, I mean, to, to kind of put into perspective where, where Klingon sits in all this, he's 89th in rebound rate in the country, which he's still really good. It's like a 23.5% rate yeah. on the defensive side. On the offensive side, he's, I want to say he's in the top 50? Yeah, 42nd, 13.8%, which together, very positive rebounding rate. But we're not talking about the best rebounder in college basketball. New. You're not talking about the best rim protector in the world. Like, the the degrees of difference between Klingon and I hate I hate doing this, but Klingon not, and not even Wemby, but Chet is so massive when you're talking about mobility and scheme fit. And even though the, the question about Chet is he's not big enough, it's like well Klingon's bigger, he can kind of support that. It's like sure, but do you want to use a top five pick on an auxiliary guy that doesn't have great? scheme fit that uh, you have to kind of build around that doesn't have much offense? You nailed it with the Zach Collins reference because what's the thing about Klingon that everybody says? He can pull you out if he needs to. He can shoot a three. He can he can extend your offense out around the perimeter if you need to. He shot one three last night. It did not go in. But at the same token, like you sat there and you looked at it and you went, How he, he has that stroke. So what people are going to do 
somebody's going to find their Neil O'Shea who's going to squint at it and say, yeah, I think we can make turn him into a shooter in the NBA where we got a seven-foot shooter now. Yeah, and that's the thing is Klingon hasn't shown that. Like, you know, Collins- what about what about Stefan Castle and Tristan Newton though? Tristan Newton, who is like Mister Big Time, just shows up at the biggest moments. This is back to back player of the uh, Final Fours for him, and I, it was amazing to see him after his struggles on Saturday to kind of reboot in the way he played last night. Yeah, no, I uh, I look six at Castle time. and Castle for me, I've got sixth on my board. And I think you can make an argument that he can get into the top five. But my my top five as it sits right now is Saar, Reza, Shea, Williams, Topic, Saloon. And the reasoning for all of those guys is, number one, the smallest guy in this group is Topic at, at 6'6". Six, six. And it's about taking swings. Like, who who has the most potential upside? Castle, I look at and go, he's kind of in the Wes Matthews mold, where yeah. it's like, can do everything but shoot. Gets after it. He's bigger than Wes was, as far as size. but. If the shooting comes around, then he's a, a really high level role player. Yeah, but I think if you if you're drafting top five again, I think you have to shoot higher than that on these guys. But yeah, and again, that's if you're wondering why UConn was so good, I just literally mentioned two guys that are going probably top twelve. Pretty good. So pretty good. It's a it's a good spot to be, but that's what the NCAA tournament can do for you. It, it can make you a lot of money. It's a money maker, fairly or unfairly. In a worst draft that we've had in a decade. Or it can, you know, upset some folks as far as their opinion on uh, Kentucky's guards in Dillingham and Shepard, who didn't show up in a game against Oakland because of a zone defense that Cal didn't have them, didn't have them ready for. Oh, boy. That's so, tough. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting place to end up. All right, coming up next, uh, we, we, we do have confirmation on uh, some news as it pertains to Oregon State and, uh, well, one more guy leaving the ship. We'll get to that out here in Danny and Dusty, Tenny the Fan.
Before I get to the kidneys, is Oregon State is now uh, likely, very likely, losing running back Damian Martinez. Pete Thamel has it now that uh, Oregon State star running back Damian Martinez has informed Oregon State coaches he intends to enter the portal. He was set to make more than $400,000 to play at Oregon State this year. Uh, and th- shout out, uh, Pete, for also highlighting that the impending transfer was first reported by Beaver Blitz. Yeah, hey, there we Jake go. Uh, this is a brutal loss to Oregon State. Not, not just the fact that Damian Martinez was the one guy who kind of stood up for the program, stood up for Oregon State and said, I'm not going anywhere. You know, he was going to ride with the Beaver Nation and with Trent Bray and this new staff. Look, the dust settles and emotions run hot when you have a coach leave and everybody's jumping ship and you want to sit there and band together. But then also you have Damian Martinez who's looking at himself potentially being the number one running back in next year's NFL draft and going, I've got to showcase myself and I've got to do what's best for me. And so when the portal opens on April 16th, it'll be no surprise to anybody that he does enter the transfer portal. But as it hits Oregon state, even worse, you go from, all right, Hey, we still have Josh gray. We still have grant Stark. We got a couple of transfers out of the portal who have at least played PAC 12 uh, football, despite the fact that they were at Colorado and their offensive line was a train wreck we could be okay. Well, now you lose that thousand yard rusher from this offense from a year ago. Would you care to guess how many yards Oregon state returns of receiving and rushing from a year ago? Combined? Combined. Would you, how much, how many yards returned for the Oregon state Beavers? 400. No, it's 598 (sighs) total yards. I was going to say 500, but I felt like that was overselling it. That return for Oregon State. And when you think of it in these terms, 78 yards rushing from Isaiah Newell. Uh, or Newell. Uh, Jake Rochelle, 34 yards rushing. Okay, that that's kind of, that's the territory that we're operating in here. As far as receiving yards go, I mean, you have to go way down the board. Um, to find your your top leading receiver when you because Silas Bolden, Anthony Gould, Jack Velling, Josiah Irish, it's um Jimmy Vaslin, who is your leading returning receiver, 154 yards last year. Like that, I mean, and look, you can go to the portal, you can try to put band aids over stuff, but having guys returning, it does matter. It does matter because, I mean, look, look what Dion did, right? He overhauled his entire roster at Colorado, brought in more transfers than we've ever seen. And sure, it got a lot of hype out the gate, but then they entered Pac-12 play and they got their teeth kicked in. That's the world that you're living in, right? Mm -hmm. Is like if you're thinking we're just going to put Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid on it, it's not how you build a a winning team. And sure, with their schedule that they have, it's not going to be a barren wasteland. They'll they'll pick up a couple of wins. Uh, they'll pick up some wins. But if this is not the end of guys entering the portal for Oregon State, good God, that's your major concern. That is your you're sitting there and you're just shaking your head, going, "When does this end for us?" And that sucks for Oregon State fans, the guys who did stick around. Th- this is a massive hit for the Beavers to lose Damian Martinez. That's the one guy that had the full-throated support of the staff Mm -hmm. and the program. I'm not surprised by this. Not to say that, oh, I saw this coming. It's more of like when you saw what Damian Martinez looked around and saw. Well, no, I I said this when Jonathan Smith left, right? It was everybody's going to want to pull together and band together. But then it's usually a couple of days, a couple of weeks, guys start looking around and you're going, hmm. This is not, and it's not good. just looking around because other schools are calling in. You're emotional about your program because mm-hmm. it is their program. There's a reason why they went there, but then reality sets in. Mm-hmm. And for Damian Martinez, I give the dude credit. In he him staying, it went a long way with salvaging whatever they could of their recruiting class and staying to this point. It it's a move which I do commend him for it. 
But at the same time, he knows he's a hot commodity and a valuable asset, and there's going to be a ton of programs that look around their running back rooms after spring ball, and they say, we need a 1,000-yard rusher. We can go we, get one of the best running backs in the could, country? We could Let's go, go out that. and get RB1, Yeah, and we can ride with him. I mean, that's the thing is, Martinez is a guy going into the draft next cycle yeah. who, you know, again, knocking on wood, bar, if he stays healthy, he's a chance to be the top running back drafted. Yep. If you're a big school and you can just go snatch that up, yeah. Here's the thing. Oregon State could be entirely fine right now. Jonathan Smith stays. Everybody stays. Aiden Child stays. They have money. And Damian Martinez could still be gone. Yes. Like that's, Very real. That's the thing. Is like He's the kind of guy that, and again, I'm not, I'm not taking, talking about his character. I'm talking about the, him as a player. Special player. He is a number one player in the country in his position. Or a potential number one player in the in his position in the country, Georgia, Oregon, Michigan, Ohio's help Michigan, they could come calling right now and go, "Hey, do you want to be the next guy that 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 fills in here?" I mean, I, I in like there's a lot of people that are like, "Ouch, what if the Ducks pick him up?" Sorry, Beef Sands. Like we've had a lot of that. That I don't think stylistically he is coming in fits that that running back room is pretty loaded. pretty loaded. Yeah. That Oregon with Whittington, Jordan James. They got the D2 National Player of the Year, who by all accounts has, has been a very dude. solid in Jay Harris uh at running back. Like they've got a they've got Jaden Lamar is in that backfield as well. Their running back room is very large. Jordan James is about to explode. Yeah, and remember how good Whittington was before he got hurt. Before he got dinged up, yeah. I mean, in that Colorado game. In in a game that was already getting out of hand, took a shot on the sideline, and and boom. But he, this season, uh, I don't think Damian Martinez goes to Oregon. I Hell, if you're Michigan, you pick up that phone because yeah. if there's one person based on who was the most upset after Jonathan Smith left who wants to kick in Michigan State's teeth, mm-hmm. it's probably Damian Martinez. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they got a Blake Corum-sized hole to fill. He is from Texas, so don't rule the Longhorns out of it. Um, Sark likes to acquire talent like Infinity, Infinity yeah. Stones. And he's done pretty well with running backs. He's really damn good. They run a gap scheme, which is going to fit what Martinez does. Downhill. Martinez wants to get downhill. Yeah. He wants to use his vision. It's not like One uh, cut pop. some of the other schools that are running more outside zone. Yeah. He is built to run in between the tackles. That would be a good system that fits him. Actually, believe it or not, the system that Lincoln Riley runs when it comes to running the football mm-hmm. It is all based on power, it's a power and scheme. Uh-huh. counter, so gap scheme, and uh, a little bit of duo as well. He would actually do very well in that system as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, former Duck. Uh, Die. Die. Die was a monster at mm-hmm. SC with Lincoln in year one. So, speaking of SC, Bear Alexander, former five-star player, also uh, entering the transfer portal. Fun note, he's going to his seventh school in seven years. Yeah, he went to four different high schools. <laughs> And now he is going. He has entered the. He will enter the transfer portal, and he's going to go to another school. It'll be seven schools in seven years. Terrell High School, Ryan High School, IMG Academy, Skyline, Georgia, USC, and to be determined. And I will say, run as fast as you can. That is red flag city. Yeah. That I mean, there are no bigger red flags than that right there. Yeah. Seven schools in seven years is. Wild, <laughs> but the portal is ruining college football. This dude yeah. went to four different high schools, yeah. so it's happening long before the portal. Oh, yep. All right, coming up next, which NFL team has the most pressure to knock it out of the park in the draft? Which is again just over two weeks away. We'll get to that first. Here's Big Will Bets with the Sports Center update.
We're going to keep it going here. Uh, thanks to the Vancouver well, 4 text line. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Souk. What? Well, we, we, we continue talking about the transition through this. Uh, the text, Dan got a $400,000 bag from OSU. Pete Thamel tweeted it. It's not like they didn't put forth a good effort. And I understand that from Oregon State fans where it's – you're like, hey, we tried to give him $400,000. I think that that's more alarming than anything else. That the money didn't solve it, the problem. It's getting dumped and saying, it's not you, it's me, <laughs> right? They are sitting there, and what Damian Martinez is saying is like, hey, I understand you gave me the $400,000. You Seemingly, that's what players want. And I keep telling people this about recruit, whether it's recruiting or whether it's about the transfer portal, relationships matter. They mm-hmm. matter a ton. Like, if you don't think, and everybody's like, well, you just offer them the most money. No, because you guess can. who offers Guess who offers a ton of money? It's Oregon, it's Texas, it's Alabama, it's Georgia, it's Tennessee, it's Ohio State, it's Michigan, it's Miami. Mm-hmm. There is no shortage of, of programs that will offer you a bun- buttload of money. You can get money... At a lot of schools around college football. I like a bunt load. We can go through over 10 schools just right off the top that can offer you the moon money-wise. It There is more there, people. Like, it, does it start a conversation? Absolutely it does. Can it help you close and get you over the top? Absolutely it can. But the money is a part of a greater conversation here because if you have a guy who's only in it for money they're going to be gone and they will leave you eventually bear alexander seven schools seven years right i mean that that guy was catching bags in high school now with damian martinez he's sitting there and he took a look around it and he said whether it's the roster whether it is the staff we don't know this right now Right. But he took a look because we know how he feels about Oregon State University as a whole. Right. We know. He told us. He told us all. He has a a lot of love and a lot of passion for Oregon State because they're the school that took the flyer on him out of high school when he was undervalued and under recruited. And they got on him early. They landed him and he was a star and And, he was really damn good. But also he's a 20 year old kid who has one opportunity to be successful in playing behind a line. Look, Gray's a stud. Let's see if he's there. And likely he's not. If you're a running back... it's it, Right now, Oregon State is not a place that... You want to be. If you are a top-level draft prospect... Yeah. It's not going to be a place where gonna, you are going to shine. It's not going to help your draft stock. And if you, and if you're talking about a position in running back where you're splitting hairs, always you're always splitting hairs yeah. about what you can or can't do. And if you're playing behind the eight ball at Oregon State, where two, three, four years ago, up until this past year, had a phenomenal offensive line. Sure, it makes sense. Even if they're not this national powerhouse, if you're a running back, go to Oregon State. The truth is going to come out about what led to him saying, I don't, I didn't want to be there. Yeah. Will he publicly bash Oregon State? I doubt it. No. I mean, he, they treated him really well. We know how he cares about the university. But they, they will get to the bottom of this, and it may not be what Oregon State fans want to hear. You obviously didn't want to hear this news today that Damian Martinez is, is leaving Oregon State and entering the transfer portal. But at the same time, we'll eventually find out what led to it, whether it is the the uncertainty around this this next season in the level of play in some of the teams that you're playing, whether it is maybe he took a look at that offense and said, nope, I'm, I'm, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. They're going to get me hurt. That, that That is a real possibility. There's also the possibility that maybe it is you know, whether it's the coaching staff or, you know, the the way that the offense has shifted with uh, Ryan Gunderson as a play caller as opposed to having Jonathan Smith as your play caller. There could be, a, it could be all of these mm-hmm. things that are wrapped into Damian Martinez's decision. But the reality of it is that the B fans got dumped today by somebody they loved, and that sucks for them. Like, that. that's terrible. And then, 
You know, there's a lot of people like, this is why I'm going to be done with college sports after this baseball season. When the Beavs start playing and they play Idaho State, I doubt you're going to be done. <laughs> I'll be watching. Yeah, I, well, I, I doubt you're going to be done. And this is the and this is going to be the big problem, is that if that happens and people aren't showing up to the newly renovated research stadium, which has just been around for one year with both mm-hmm. sides completed, and people aren't watching their games on TV, they will lose that seat at the table, and you that's going to be one that is going to be really tough to earn back. That's the thing is, do you... Is, is the door closed? No, it's not yet. What What's the path? The path. Well, the Super League would be one because the Super League would include Washington State and Oregon State, as they were um, kind of releasing last week. How do you hold on for the next that, two years? That is one. Well, with the money from the Pac-12. No, but I mean, like, how, how are you, you a, a functional program over the next two well, years? Well, you have to win games. And because and that's the thing is you have to win football games because here's the thing it's like Oregon State fans are like ah we you know we got kicked to the side and I get it you feel beat down but don't tell that to Boise State fans that started as a junior college <laughs> and then went to D two and then the FCS and then to the FBS and that place is sold out every single week and they are a viable football program. There is a path, but you can't have your entire fan base turn your back on you like that. That's full stop. Because who's why is that attractive to anybody? Or look at it's the not. look at the SMU model too. Like SMU was on the outside looking in rally and rally the troops. Um, like let's not say the ACC is perfect. I'm sure they don't feel a hundred percent amazing about where they're at, but they went from a group of five to now they are in the power four well, and that came from boosters. Right. So Oregon state would have to do the same, but that's an option as well. Like bide your time, get your money right. And when the moment is there, you have to pounce Utah, BYU, central Florida, Cincinnati, Houston. They've all, they've all created their own path. SMU, as you just mentioned, they've all created their own path to get there, but it took, not a abandoning of ship, but circling the wagons. And also, that, that's what Oregon State needs, and it sucks to say, like, but if if you ever want to get back, that's what you have to do. It's also a massive infusion of cash. Yeah, for all of those schools, where Oregon State has yet to see that. Well, they they've got a good infusion from the NCAA tournament money, their remaining Pac-12 money. Their but starting their, ground is a lot better than some of the others, especially like a Central Florida. Like sure. Central Florida had to prove it, and then they did. They pounced on it, and and that's when they got their influx of money. Is when all of a sudden you start winning football games, and boom, you have your fake ass national title, Scott Frost. But, well, the difference is, is that Oregon State that. They have won games, and they still haven't gotten that big infusion of cash. But this is your time to get your rallying cry. But Come to the table now, or it won't matter. This is one that, with Oregon State, they have gotten an infusion of cash. It started in 2000, and they got they got a bump. And then when the Gary Anderson debacle happened, and that was the worst Power 5 program in the country— they got an infusion of cash, and and they did a really good job of injecting money into that program to say, we don't want to be here anymore. We do not want to be here anymore. And that is, that's one thing that they, they have gotten small little jabs in the arm, but they need, they need a big old steroid shot. They need it right in the rear. And they, like this text, BSU and OSU aren't uh, comparable. One built up and one... Ha- had it but it got ripped away they are they if you lose your fans you are actually at a better place to start this thing because you have a fan base and you have a that power five money infusion that is already gonna be there because the pac-12 is is dissipating there's a hundred million dollars over the next two years going to the cougs and the beeves like that's a there's actually some, a there's some jump real start money there and that's the thing is like but then that's the thing is this is a it's a it's a life raft that it's not infinite. No, and that's why they can't. Like this thing runs out of air. You cannot have the the mass exodus of fans. I know it's going to be the natural way that you want to go, but 
unfortunately, it's easy to care when you're winning. Unfortunately, the the reality is that if everybody abandons ship mm-hmm. and the fans turn their back on on their program that they do love, and you do love it, if that happens, then everybody that left you behind is saying, eh, "See, see, so justified." That's why we did it. Yeah. That's the thing. It's it's easy. It's easy to care for your team when when you're winning and things are going well. It's, yep. it's super fun to ride the highs. Yep. But if you're if you're a B fan and the, this is one of those uh, ride of the lowest kind of situations. Yep. Because if you don't, like you said, not, not even just to see the table, it might get worse than that. You you might be relegated to beyond just the next rung down. Uh, they're not going to, they're not going to drop past Mountain West territory. But I mean, the Mountain West territory might be further removed from where it is now. Uh, well, yeah. When the 12 team playoff and the cash infusion starts happening. Well, that's the uphill climb. I mean, this is the, again, we're going through this again, but this is that worst case scenario that everybody was talking about. So, sorry, B fans. Uh, wish we had some better news, but that's, that's the way the cookies crumbling right now. Hopefully the, uh. That salsa money can uh, can cobble something together here over the next two years. Yeah, well, yeah, if a lot more than that. They need that Nvidia money. Yeah, that's a they need that graphics card money for sure. Mining some Bitcoin. All right, coming up next, we'll get ready to hand you off to Isaac and Suk here on Danny and Dusty, Tenny the fan.
Jackson. Uh, he did actually participate in live contact practices, but he just wasn't able to push through with enough games left. All right, to so get on the floor. no Shane Sharp. And that actually does suck because you wanted to, you know, get one of the things with this injury. Dame talked about this a ton. Nas talked about it. Everybody's talked about which it. Which is. But you got to get through the mental hurdle of playing and, through this. Well, no, yeah, the physical hurdle. Like you, you develop scar tissue in the area that just takes a little while to kind of push through. It's awkward and it's uncomfortable, and you're just gonna kind of get through it. Uh, it sounds like if the Blazers had like four or five more games remaining, let's say they had eight, nine, ten left, he might give it a go. Just he would get more opportunities to get out there and kind of work through it. Yeah, that, that he might have an opportunity, but this with with only four left, it's just not gonna happen. And it's a lost season. Yeah. It's a lost season, it is. and that's that's Ant's a tough injuries, part. Scoot's injuries, Shane's injuries. Well, I think it's it's a lost season for him specifically. Like every, mm-hmm. it, we all knew that this was going to be a lost season when it started, but the fact that Shaden Sharp, we've seen flashes, but again, we don't see consistency. And this would, could could have been a year with everything else that was going on with this team in this roster that you could have seen his development and watched him grow a little bit, but. Nothing. We get zip zero zilch. Not a. I think you get a little taste. That was about it. You got to see him as the lead guy yeah, for a little they, bit, and so that's the kind of thing that you explore a, this week. No, no, it's a lost. That's lost. Sure, though. that's fine. But you you have to be able to take something from this because if you if you don't, then you're just saying that you literally just threw a year out because you did get thirty what thirty two games worth of data on it. It's not enough. It's not great. You want no. more always. But the thing you do have to take from this, okay, okay, we did get X, Y, and Z. So here's the things that we take from that versus on top of his rookie year, and we go, these are the things that we want him working on this summer. Because everybody's like, well, the growth of in the season, most of your growth isn't in season. Most of your growth and the things that you yeah. work on are off season. You, the in season is about refining and developing the little things, the, the the timing, the reps, like those things. All of that comes from working through things in the off season over and over and over again. Can Shaden Sharp develop his handle? Can Shaden Sharp be a guy that you don't need to tell to shoot? Can Shaden Sharp develop some aggressiveness going downhill and attacking the rim? Like Those are the things that maybe you would hope to get better answers to this season that you just didn't get the opportunity to see in the final remaining, what, 80 games or 50 games. I mean, we have only seen him play 112 games in his, in his career, and he's entering year three. Right? Yeah, he's going into year three, which is typically your your big breakout season. And last year, what we knew and what we saw, a lot of those were minutes with nobody else around him on the floor, and that those are wasted. A lot of those were wasted minutes last last year's rookie year, and that's that's the thing I say that this is a wasted season is because we we really haven't. How many games have we seen with Shaden Sharp where he is actually around NBA caliber? Starting caliber players. How many games of those one twelve? Not many. Not ma- probably and, thirty-five to forty. And so I go, how much do we really know? You know, and that that's the big question. That that's where I see it as a waste season. You're right. I mean, we did see a lot of those flashes and a lot of those things that he can work on over the course of this off season. But do we really know what he needs to fine tune when we haven't really seen him with? I think so. The, with with the talent that's no, commiserate well, because he's not a number one and he's not a number two. Well, well, regard, well, the thing is, I don't think we know what he is. <laughs> that's the, that's regardless <laughs> regardless of that. But no, I mean, with guys that come in the league at nineteen years old, you don't. He's twenty one years old. He's a baby. He's a little baby. Remember, the last competitive basketball he played before he came to the NBA was in the EYBL. He didn't go to college. There's yeah. no development. There's nothing up there. And that's what sucks about this whole year for yeah. him. And it does. Like, it, and that's that's my point. Yeah. Is like, he hasn't played a lot of basketball. But that's my point. I, I think you understand the general idea yeah. of what he needs to work on. Yeah. And then whether or not he's uh, above average rotation player, a starting caliber player, a near star, all star, all NBA, like that stuff's going to sort itself out. And you don't. You most guys who reach that level. It it takes six seven years. Like yeah. The occasional generational guy.